Thanks, everyone. Sorry for that delay. Uh, thank you for sticking around. And um, yeah, I, I'm going to tell you a story about reactivity. And um, just if you have done anything with reactive languages, stream languages, time variants, user interfaces, animation, you probably have used one of those. You probably fell somewhere in one of those circles. Don't, don't take the boundaries between those two literally. This is, I just drew it, you know, by, by mouse, not by hand. But um, uh, the thing is, it's a pretty complicated picture. It's really hard to know what's, what's going on there, right? And even the terms that you see there have been used and abused uh, to the point that uh, we don't know what they mean anymore. And I can tell you from my experience uh, working uh, using temporal logic, for example, at NASA, is we have meetings where we have one-hour discussions about a property in temporal logic, and we can't agree on how it behaves. And uh, the gist of the problem is that we can't agree on what logic we're using. Because depending on the reference that you use, the logic is defined in a different way. So it's a pretty complex thing to figure out. So just to make things a bit more concrete, um, this is an example of what functional reactive programming looks like. And there are, you know, there are different implementations, there are different flavors. But um, in functional reactive programming, the, the um, first class citizens, or the things that you, the, you define, are called signals or behaviors, which are time variant entities. And in the original description, they vary over continuous time. These days, well, it's to be discussed. But for example, the mouse position is something that, that changes over time, that varies over time. And you can, uh, see, you can see the mouse position as, as a position that uh, depends on the time. So if you, it's, yeah. So uh, for example, if, if you define conceptually a signal um, carrying values of type A as a function from time to A, then the mouse position would be just a, a function from type to positions. So at any point in time, you know the position of the mouse. And you could define an animation as a signal that produces pictures. And you, you, know, you take the mouse position, you displace it by a certain amount, and then you paint a, a red circle on that position, and so on. Stream programming is kind of similar, but not exactly the same. So you'll see some similarities, but um, time is no longer continuous. It is discrete. Conceptually, you work with a co-inductive stream. And then, for example, in Copilot, which is the language that we have at NASA, um, an, intern, an external stream, an input to the system, is defined as a, something called an extern. And it has this type. And in this case, we don't have tuples. We can't work with tuples, but we can work with arrays of fixed length. And then you, know, you, you can prepend samples to it. You can add uh, a value at all times. So you have like um, point-wise modifications. Um, you can, you can project values from the array. So this, for example, would take the input defined here, which at any point in time carries an array with two elements. And it would obtain the first. So this would give you the x, presumably the x coordinate of the mouse position. And then you can apply point-wise modifications. So you see that you have temporal modifications here. You have uh, point-wise or atemporal modifications here. How do these differ? Oh, what happened? Oh, boy. What's going on? Is that you or me? I think it's the last one. If you wiggle the cable back there. I'm trying not to. OK, let me see if I can not touch the screen. The, the. There we go. All right, we're back on. So um, how do these differ? Like, what are, what are the different dimensions across which they differ? So you could consider that, uh, and this applies also for the others that we saw in the picture, uh, in some time it's, it's continuous. In other, it's discrete. It can be bounded. It can be unbounded. It can be linear or branching. In some temporal logics, you have branching uh, time. Um, it can be explicit or implicit. In streams, time is implicit. Uh, it, there's a notion of passage of time in the fact that you enroll the stream in the different samples, but it, you don't know the actual time. If you want to know it, you have to count it manually. In others, in FRP, it tends to be uh, explicit. 
Um, systems can be causal or non-causal. There are some FRP flavors in which you can describe non-causal behaviors. And um, then in some of them, you can work with any values that you can express in the programming language. In others, you have a restricted set of values, and there's good reasons for that. And then there are other constraints that you have to work with. Uh, some of those flavors, uh, there are constraints that have to do with memory consumption because of the target application. And we're trying to make sense of that picture. So for these two that we saw uh, in FRP, time is continuous conceptually. It's unbounded. It starts at time zero and it's explicit. And, and in stream programming, it's discrete, unbounded, starts at zero and it's implicit. In both of them, you can, you can delay things, but in one of them, you can delay with no limit. In Yampa, you can go as far back in time as you want. And for example, in, in, in Copilot in particular, this is not, does not apply to all stream languages, but in Copilot in particular, you can only go so far back in time. And that has to be determined statically because there's memory implications and it's used in hard real time and it's used in, in uh, devices with limited memory. So we need to know the, the boundaries. Um, in some, you can look into the future. In Copilot, you can go back in time and then you are allowed to look into the future. Whereas in, in Yampa, for example, you can never do that. And um, in Yampa, you can put any value in a, in a signal. And in Copilot, you have limited values, right? So these are how some of these differ. So going back to this picture, uh, imagine trying to map all of that for all the flavors that you see around. If, if, you're, you know, if you're struggling to understand what it looks like, uh, you're not alone, right? It, it's really complicated, even for experts, even for people who work in this domain. We struggle to understand the difference between FRP implementations. So uh, I've been on, on this, on this uh, race to try to minimize the number of implementations around, try to give people mechanisms to, to uh, define their implementations on top of more abstract layers so that it's easier also to compare them. And this is a bit what this story is about. Um, this story is incomplete. Uh, you can be part of it. If you disagree, like say it. If you think I wouldn't do it that way, say it. If something's missing and it doesn't fit your, your use case, I want to know about it. Uh, it, it. We're only at the beginning. We're trying to figure things out. But the reason why we're doing this is because, first of all, we, need to, we want to know how these frameworks compare. And specifically, we want to know if we see an expression in one of them, can we literally just translate it to another? And is it going to mean something roughly equivalent? Or does the meaning change completely? How, is, how does that affect the, the expression? And um, also, we have libraries of um, reactive definitions and, and so on that we would like to reuse for other frameworks. And we don't know if we can, because we don't know how the meaning uh, maps across. So the solution that we opted for, at least for this paper, is, is this. Is, um, we want to provide uh, abstractions, both both mathematical and programming abstractions, so that you can define a reactive flavor uh, in, in terms of these abstractions. So you both tell the, the, the formal aspect of it and also the programming aspect of it. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the programming only. And if you want to look at, at the, how those programming abstractions are defined mathematically, you can look at the paper. But to give you an example a bit more concrete is, OK, well, you have reactive entities. And we said that we cannot put any values, so we, we define a class so that you can talk about reactive entities and their values in the present. So in the present, you can put values inside. This is, oh, yeah, OK. So you can put values inside, and you can apply a constraint to them. And that allows you to define if any value will be allowed or only some of them. And also, you can determine which functions can be applied to those values. And that gives you the versatility of saying not all Haskell functions can be applied, or maybe I have a specific type that represents functions in my language. And then what you see here is some sort of constrained applicative. Right? We have pure and apply, but they use these constraints and this fun instead of any Haskell function. Right? But the ideas are, are kind of the same. And this is the implementation for Yampa. Yampa uh, the signal functions in Yampa are applicatives. So that's it. The story is settled. Like you just use pure and apply, and then there's uh, use any Haskell function as the function type, and there there are no constraints, and you were done. And this is generally true for, I believe, any applicative. 
Um, in Copilot, the story is a lot more complicated. And I'll go back to this later, but I, I don't expect everyone to, to get this immediately or for you to remember these details. But um, the, there are two things that I want to highlight. The first one is that we do have a type constraint because Copilot is a language that is compiled to hard real time C. So we only support the types that we know how to represent in C. And that is captured with a class called typed in the language. And that's why we have this here. And the other is that it, it doesn't support any function in C. Again, we don't have malloc uh, loops or recursion, so we only support a limited set of functions. And uh, we had to define, to give this instance in this, in this abstraction, we had to define kind of like a wrapper for the copilot operations. And that allows us to define the, apply the, the, the definition of apply for the instance. Now, now that we have this, we can write the definition like that. Say, something that is always true is just pure true. And what we know about the, the uh, signature is that bool has to meet the type constraints of your reactive entities. And that's it. Now, what does this mean? If you're in continuous time, this means it, this is continuously true. If you're in streams, this means it's true at every sample. But the meaning is determined by, I hope I'm not pointing the laser at anybody over there. <laughs> uh, the, the meaning is determined by the instance that you pick. So you can start writing components this way, in a generic way, and then just determine how they're going to be uh, interpreted depending on your use case. Now, those are point-wise transformations meaning they are atemporal. You only look at the values now. You can put a value constantly, and then when you apply operations, they apply at every point in time. But um, the, the, the power of these languages comes from their temporal nature. So um, the first thing that, that we did in this interface is that we, we expect everyone to define the notion of time. Even if it is implicit, we need to know what the time is, because there's going to be operations that will still need to, to, to use the time. So we, we just define a class with a type for the time. And in the case of Yampa, for example, it's, oh, excuse me. In the case of Yampa, it's a double. It could be like, technically it's a positive, conceptually it's a positive real or a non-negative real. And, um, and in practice, it tends to be like a non-negative uh, double. But we just use a double. And for streams, again, it could be a natural, but we just put an end. And now we can start talking about temporal transformations. And instead of adding delays or whatnot, uh, we kind of took a step back and thought about transformations in terms of the stream as a whole. So um, if you think of something that varies over time, uh, one of the uh, very common constructs in these languages is that you want to determine the value of something based on the values that you had in the past, right? So for example, um, the position of your player is the position where it was, except a little bit to the left if your joystick is that way, and a little bit to the right if your joystick is that way. So you kind of like update in some way. And it's very common that you express uh, the values of things in terms of the values of the past. What does that mean, though? Like if you have a signal or some, time, some sort of time-varying entity, what does it mean to, to talk about the past? Well, what it means is that you're, you really shifted the thing towards the future, which is a bit ironic, right? But to make a value of the past available at this time, you need to shift the thing to the right. And when you do that, you leave a gap. And then the thing becomes kind of like a bit undefined at that time. So the way that we kind of solve that problem, and this aligns fairly well with how these frameworks work in practice, because we need something that will we'll be able to implement things on top, so we need a practical solution, is that we define a, a notion of concatena con concatenatable uh, reactive entities. Reactive entities for which we can talk about chunks or portions, and then we can kind of put them together. And there's a mathematical definition of this, but the practical side of it is that one, that concatenation takes a finite chunk and presumably an infinite one, and then it kind of puts them together. And um, the constructor for the finite ones takes the duration of the finite entity 
and uh, an entity, and it gives you just that chunk. So it kind of like segments a larger one, a larger reactive entity, and, and only takes a, a portion of it. And now we can define something like this, right? So we first, we define, this is the definition of a counter, something that goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So um, we define a finite entity by saying that we have a, a reactive entity that is constantly 0, and we take one unit, one time unit from it, and that gives us a chunk. And then we kind of recurse over that definition. So the first portion is going to be 0, the next one is going to be 1 plus what we had before, the next one's going to be 2 plus what we have before. So it ends, it ends up drawing a picture like this, right? At the beginning, this, this portion here is that one over there. And when you recurse, you kind of add one and then shift it to the right. And then add one and shift it to the right. So this is the add one, and this thing will shift it to the right. And that's why, how you end up with that piecewise signal, right? Now. If I go back to this signature, you'll see that all I am assuming about it is that there's a notion of concatenation, that the values meet the type constraint of the reactive entity, that time is a number because I'm, I'm saying one, so it's, it's got to be a number, and that the values are in numbers because I'm saying zero here and one here, so I have to be able to operate with them. Is time continuous or, or discrete? Is time linear or branching? There's no assumptions there, right? And that means if you interpret this thing in a stream, uh, with a stream backend, then this is this accession of values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But if you interpret it in Yampa, this is the, the piecewise signal that is 0 for one time unit, 1 for one time unit, two, and so on. So if you sample really slow, if your time deltas are really small, then you'll see that the value zero stays on for, like the signal stays at zero for a long number of samples because you're not advancing time as fast. It really obeys the continuous time semantic of the language. And um, similarly, if you can shift things towards, you know, the the right, and that means you look into the past, what happens if you shift in the other direction? Are you looking into the future? And what does that mean? So not all languages allow you to do that. Thank you. And what we provide is um, a drop operation in a, in a class that, that captures that idea. The idea that you have something that is non-causal, where the present can depend on the future. And not all frameworks implement that. In particular, Yampa does not implement that. In Yampa, you cannot drop samples. You cannot look into the future. But in Copilot, you can. If you, look, if you go to the past, then now you can look into the future. So um, again, the, the difference here is that you, you're not concatenating. You're just you know, trimming a, a chunk of the, of the reactive entity. So you just need to provide the time and then the entity, and then you get something that is shifted. Right? We just forget about the all values. And to give you an example of how that could be used, uh, sometimes we, we get a, a signal from a sensor or some kind of information from a sensor, and um, we need to smoothen it out. We need to, we need to uh, eliminate the, uh, what's the word? The outliers, say, they kind of like make them not as pronounced. And one way that we can do that is we can average a value by it, the value at the next sample, and the value two samples from now, and then we consider, you know, we smoothen thing a little, things a little bit. And that's how you write it, right? You say that the total is the average of now plus one sample from now plus two samples from now divided by three, and that's it. And again, what we're assuming is it's non-causal because you're using drop. Time is a number because you're putting one and two here. And then that the values are fractional because you're dividing by three. And that's it. It doesn't tell you any more than this. It doesn't tell you that it's stream-based. You could do this in a framework that, is, that allows non-causality if it's continuous time, which there are some, right? So we have a backend for three uh, reactive programming implementations. We have one for Yampa, one for Copilot, and one for Dunai. We almost finished one for Clash, 
but we we didn't. We, but we're almost we're right there. But Copilot has an FPGA backend, so we just by by using the abstract interface, we can already target hard real time C uh, simulation interpretation uh, FPGAs and and so on. So it, it's pretty useful already. But I'm sure that we can implement more, and then it will be more useful for the community. Um, this is part of a larger context. We have a couple of projects at NASA that I invite you to, to check out and, and participate in. Uh, they're called Ogma and Copilot. Copilot is, is a runtime monitoring language that generates hard real time C. And Ogma is kind of like Copilot on steroids. It allows you to deploy Copilot in, um, in flight software and, and stuff that is really used in missions. And um, the current state of things is that we're trying to implement more of the YAMPA libraries and more of the Copilot libraries on top of this abstract framework so that we can reuse more. One thing that you may have noticed is that when we talked about this, um, yeah, yeah, here, here, here. When we talked about this, this was pretty darn complicated. And there's a reason for that. Copilot is a language that was designed by use. It's a language designed by need, not by value. You know, it is, we added features to the language as we needed them. And it turns out that when you step back and try to analyze things from a formal perspective, they don't quite fit. So maybe we need to redesign Copilot so that things mathematically make a bit more sense. And uh, so it is informing the next version of Copilot. That's what I was trying to, to come to. And One more? Yeah. And um, we're at the point that the next thing that we'll try to implement is temporal logics on top, like a backend for temporal logics. Because that's, that's a pretty weird one, right? Linear temporal logic is, is uh, future looking only. So, well, it depends on who you ask, right? Some, some allow past time and future time, some only allow future time. But it's, it's unlike the ones that you saw on the screen. Most of them have a past direction. That's everything I came to say. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, your opinions, comments, questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Hi. Uh, Alexa out of Google. Um, it seems pretty obvious that if you have a continuous time um, functional reactive language, you could write down a system of ordinary differential equations in it, and the language should evolve them. Um, do you, any, you know any systems that use sophisticated integration techniques to do that, like Rangikata instead of you know, Euler? Not really, no. So, um, is that even like a thing that makes sense to think it, about? It is a thing that makes sense, and it, it is a question that comes up. So Hendrik Nielsen, who created Yampa, at some point uh, explore the notion that he called um, functional hybrid simulation. And the idea was FRP extended with differential equations. Um, YAMPA supports, it, it doesn't really try to solve the equations, but you can write the equations and sometimes they cannot work. And uh, for example, I have, I have examples of like basic planetary systems simulated in YAMPA. You just write the equations of gravity and they hit, you hit run and it kind of works because sometimes they kind of, they resolve right. Uh, then there is Mark Pousset, I, I think he's at INRIA, um, has worked on, I think it's called Zelos, which is a language that incorporates uh, differential equations and it's reactive and, and so on. It, it, it inherits uh, ideas from Lustre, but then incorporates uh, differential equations. So maybe that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Vasil from Chaos. Uh, I would like to ask uh, why there is a hard limit on the time in the zero? Because uh, you, you could have, for example, uh, time after Christ, before Christ. Uh, you could move <laughs> before zero and go negative. Uh, why there is a hard limit on, on the zero? Is there a needed I, a limit? I, I don't think it is needed. I think probably what happened is that uh, all the examples that are there had a time, like a starting point at zero, but it would make sense to, ex to explore before. And there was, a, there was some work done by, um, 
Christian, do you remember his name? Uh, he was at he was at Twente. Uh, he was working with Jan Cooper. He had a system that was similar to functional reactive, um, but he was right before me. So it was a similar system to functional reactive uh, programming, but you could bo go back in time before zero. So it, it, I think it absolutely makes sense. If if you have some repeating sequence or something that repeats, like sinus cosine, cosine yeah. Uh, it could go back in time and go forward. Yeah. No, there is no limit. Yeah. For that. I, I think Only infinity of uh, some types like that one float, but. I, I think you're yeah. right. I think we need to look into it. Absolutely. Yeah. And Thanks. if you have a, a practical example of a language in which that comes up, I'd like to know about it. Yeah. I don't have. <laughs> Just I have <laughs> example from the history, which is yeah, before Christian, after Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And maybe uh, there's problem 2000 before the problem and after the problem. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yes. One more question? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you've introduced a number of type classes that, uh, and, and also explained that the things that implement them all have kind of different semantics. And I'm wondering if you have uh, rules or laws that go along with them that someone who makes a new FRP system, they can say, oh, mine definitely you know, can be an instance of this type class or not. Um, whereas I think sort of what you've described so far feels very intuitive. Oh, mine kind of has a notion of the future or the past, so maybe I can implement one or the other of these type classes. So if, if, if I understand your question correctly, um, I think if you look at the paper, you'll see the answer to that. Because what we, what we did was first lay out the mathematical framework and then try to explain the um, the denotation of those functions and those interfaces in terms of that framework. And then we give the instances. So that's why I say it should inform the next version of Copilot, because we should step back and, and try to think about the mathematical ideas. And I think that's, that's where it is. Thanks. I'll take a look at the paper. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. It's okay. No, go for it. Uh, so Christian by QB Logic. Um, uh, why this uh, one in, in Yampa? Uh, why does it map to uh, one double? Why not epsilon? He said if you sample it, you can see zero for a very long time. But it was very unclear to me why he said, well, one time step. Why doesn't, and he said in Yampa, well, it matches to double. Why does not match to the smallest double? Uh, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm not understanding the question. So in your counter, in this example about counter, yeah. right, why, why is that one not the smallest uh, double value, basically? You said it's it, one well, unit. One, so one, one is one time unit. Uh, what's the smallest unit in Yampa? Uh, well, it's, in the case of Yampa, that would be, okay. So... It's not one second. Like, the, the way that Yampa operates is that when you run it, you provide the time. And the time doesn't really have to be real time. The time is abstract. So what I mean when I say one time unit is I mean one in that abstract domain. Does that make sense? Like Yampa doesn't take care, doesn't, doesn't control the execution loop for you. You do. And you decide if, if one means one second, one year, and one, and so on. Okay. Thanks. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yeah, I guess. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again.